Thank you. Well, it's nice to be here with you today. I'm glad that we have the opportunity to talk about a really important skill set. We're going to be talking about crucial confrontations. And first of all, I just want to describe what we mean by crucial confrontations. Now, I know that many of you have had an experience, whether at home, at work, at school, where you had a certain set of expectations, right, that you believed that somebody else was going to come through on a commitment that they've made to you, that they said that they would be at a certain place at a certain time and that they would be there. True? Yeah? Now, this skill set is for specifically when you had those expectations and they weren't realized. That people aren't behaving as they said they would. They aren't keeping their commitments. Poor behavior. They missed the mark. You had certain expectations and there's opened up a gap in those expectations between what you thought was going to be the performance and what the actual performance was. Now, I was working in an organization not too long ago where they were experiencing this kind of gap. I said, we have people here who are really difficult to get along with performance issues. I said, well, how do you handle them? I said, well, we figure that eventually they're going to retire, so we just kind of stick it out. And I said, well, how long till this person retires? And they said, oh, it'll be about 10 years. <laughs> Whoa. What happens in an organization when these gaps aren't addressed? What's the cost? That's what we want to take a look at this morning. Because when faced with these gaps, when faced with a miscommitment, someone fails to deliver, we have two choices. The first one is that we talk it out. The second one is that we act it out. So many times we find that people are choosing this second choice, that they act out rather than talk out their concerns. And another organization that I was working with just recently he said, we had a similar kind of problem. He said, we have this behavior here called passing the trash. He said, passing the trash? What's that? He said, well, we have someone who's underperforming. We give them kind of a mediocre performance review, and then first chance we get, we transfer them to another department. Now, imagine, what's that costing this organization? As they started to look at this, they found it was costing them more than they thought. They realized that there would be an impact on morale, that people wouldn't be as satisfied as they could be. But they didn't realize what effect it would have on productivity. They found that they had a certain number of people who became the go-to people, and they got the majority of the work. They got about 80% of the task because we could trust them to get it done. What about the other 80%? They're kind of coasting, letting it slide. Right? What message does that send to the organization? It's okay to do that kind of thing. And so you started to see more and more people neglect commitments that they had made because that's just part of our culture. Until it was pretty regular, current event that people would only deliver about 85% on a project or be, you know, two to three weeks late on the good side. This became habitual in the organization. About a year ago, they hit some tough financial times, and they uh, had another cost that was incurred that was unanticipated. They had a lot of underperformers in their organization, and it cost them about $3.5 million in packages to get these lower performers out of the organization to start over. They Stood around and talked about it and said, I can't believe how much dead wood we had here. So I asked him, I said, did you hire dead wood? <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, how did it get there? How did this situation come to pass? And so often, it's because we are acting out rather than talking out our concerns around these performance gaps. So, <clears throat> if you are able to talk through these high stakes, right, disappointments, you'll see productivity increase. In one organization that we worked in, manufacturing, when they were able to address this issue, it led to a 50% increase in productivity. 
at a high-tech firm where they developed software codes. They found that when they were able to catch these problems and address them early, early on, talk them through, that they were able to improve quality by 30%. In their industry, they have something called a SEV1. A SEV1 is a fatal error in code. It means it's going to grind your program to a stop. So they reduced the number of SEV1 problems, errors, that were being created in the code, therefore improving quality by about 30%. We also look beyond industry and find that if you're able to confront other people about disappointments, that it can improve your relationship. There's been a number of scholars, some of which you may be familiar with. Uh, Markman <coughs> out of the University of Denver, uh, Gottman out of the University of Washington who have studied how those couples who are most successful, who report most satisfaction in their relationships, get to that point. We often think of it as how much we have in common or how much mutual love we feel. Those things are important, but the predictor of success, of happiness, is how we handle the negative emotions, the gaps in our expectations. What Markman found, one of those researchers, was if he could help people deal with these situations, he could reduce the number of people who would get divorced by about 50%. Amazing. Find that these skills will help you improve your relationships at home, at work. Improve your ability to influence, to get to results while actually building and fostering relationships. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a powerful process. Crucial confrontation derives its power from the process. It gives you steps to think about what to do before, during, and then after a confrontation. Today we're going to look at one of those before skills. And we're going to be looking at the top of that model. It says what to do before we go into a crucial confrontation. Uh, I need to pause for a moment and uh, to preface this next little section, share with you a proverb that I recently learned. Uh, my sister-in-law is Japanese, and she grew up in Hokkaido. And the other day she shared this proverb with me, Japanese proverb. She said, they have a saying that goes like this. It's better to have the wrong solution to the right problem than the right solution to the wrong problem. Let me repeat that one more time. It's better to have the wrong solution to the right problem than the right solution to the wrong problem. Crucial confrontations are interesting because they're often complex. And we believe that just because we're talking, we're solving the problem. We want to make sure that, first of all, we're wrestling with the right problem. Make sure we have our arms around the right issue. And sometimes that can be difficult. So I want to teach you two skills here to help you before you get into this confrontation to get to the right problem. <clears throat> okay. So here's the first one. It's called CPR. Now, a lot of you are familiar with CPR. Ever heard of CPR before? This is different. <laughs> Usually you think of this as is cardiac pulmonary resuscitation, right? To resuscitate a person. Well, in some ways, it's the same. It's how do we resuscitate a relationship that's kind of broken because of patterns of missed commitments. CPR in this context stands for content, pattern, and relationship. Content, pattern, and relationship. Let me describe each one of those for you. Content. Content tend to be issues that we experience the first time. And I've made an agreement with someone and they didn't follow through. I deal with that issue content. Most of the chronic problems that we experience in organizations are not, I repeat, not content in nature. They're more pattern or relationship in nature. So let me describe that middle one, the pattern conversation to you. I'd given a presentation, and after the presentation, there was a woman who approached me. <clears throat> she was a home health care nurse, worked with a number of others who served people actually here in uh, Salt Lake City. 
And uh, she was really excited about the content. She said, this was great, and it would never work with my group. I really loved what you said, but I've tried it. I've held the conversation, and nothing changes. So I asked her to describe a little bit about what she was dealing with. She says, well, as home health care nurses, we go out and we make visits to people's homes. And then we come back, and we're required by law within a certain time frame, to fill out a report, condition of the patient, medications administered, and so forth. And I'm in charge of receiving those reports. And I typically get those reports two to three days later than what's required by law. When I noticed this, I went in to solve the problem. We got into our next team meeting. I sat down. It was my turn to talk. I held up the report, and I said, these reports are really important and I need you to turn them in on time. Reasonable request, right? Everyone nodded their head and said, yes, 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 we know, we'll do it. Well, next week rolls around. What happens? Reports are late again. Next week rolls around. Reports are late again. And so she goes back into the meeting, and she has a new strategy now. She sits down and she says, these reports are really, really, really important. Right? She whips out that triple really. Does it change? No, right? They're all nodding their heads and saying, yes, 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 we agree. Yes, we'll do that. The next week rolls around, nothing happens. So she starts to get very upset. And anytime she can, she directs them towards the reports. It right? makes subtle comments until one day she can take it no longer. She comes in with a new strategy. She sits down, and as soon as the meeting starts, she whips out that report, and she says, these reports are really important. You notice how her strategy's changed? (laughs) Slower and louder, right? That'll solve the problem, does it? No. Think about this for a moment. Why does she remain stuck? Is she wrestling with the right problem? I'd submit to you, no. That she's dealing with this as if Reports are really important is the problem. What's the real problem? The real problem is that week after week, they say they'll turn them in on time, and then they don't. Until she gets to that issue, she remains stuck. So often we only deal with that surface issue. Reports are important, and we don't get down to the pattern that is really at the root of lack of results, of missed opportunities, all the types of problems we've been talking about today. Now, there's another type of conversation that we can also hold, right? We talked about content. We talked a little bit about pattern. But there's also this relationship kind of conversation. Patterns left unchecked eventually spill into the relationship. I was working in another organization at one point, corporate HR. They had to coordinate at times with the university in the organization. They said, depending who's at top will determine who gets power below. So you have one leader and the HR department's more empowered. You have another leader and corporate university's more empowered. Well, this fellow from HR, he has to coordinate with schedules and plannings and so forth for the next year with his counterpart from the university. He says, I will not have a conversation with them about anything. I said, why is that? Because I don't trust them. Any information that I provide will be used against me. So why should I have a conversation? Where is he stuck? This is a pattern over time that's starting to affect the relationship. It starts to affect trust. That's the issue. Until they resolve that, they remain stuck. It's not about they're going to use the information against me as much as it is I can't trust that the information that you're giving me is going to be accurate, that you're going to live up to your word. Different kind of conversation. Now what makes all of these issues, situations and circumstances so tough is that sometimes we have all three. Right? A content, the latest infraction of a pattern that's been going on that's starting to affect my relationship. So one of the things that will be super important as you go to address your situations is first ask yourself, what kind of issue am I dealing with? Content, pattern, 
and relationship. And a little trick that's been helpful for me is to be able to distill it down into one sentence so that I know with clarity what the gap is. If you can do this, you'll find that many of the problems that seemed unsolvable are more likely to be solved because you're getting your arms around the right problem. So thank you very much and good luck as you step out to the crucial confrontations that you face.